All month, we've been talking about clearing the gaps in our life. And you know what I mean by the gap by now, right? We're talking about here's the person I am right now. Here's who I am today. And over here is the person I know I'm really supposed to be. Here's the person God called me to be. Here's the person God created me to be. And there's this gap between who I am now and who I know I'm really supposed to be. And we so said we have to figure out how to clear that gap. How, how do we become who we're really supposed to be? And so we talked in the first week, we talked about the holiness gap. And we said that Jesus had cleared the holiness gap for us, that that was a gap we couldn't clear on our own. Only Jesus, who was both God and human, could clear the holiness gap. Only Jesus could reconcile sinful human beings with holy God by being both God and human. But we said all the other gaps that exist in our life, these are gaps we can clear. These are gaps that God gives us the power and the ability to clear if we choose to do so. And so in week one, we talked about the sacrifice gap and how we clear the sacrifice gap. And we said we do that by recognizing that our life is not our own, that we are the creation and we were made by the creator and we exist for him and for his purposes. And so we have to recognize our life is not our own, that we belong to him. And we clear that sacrifice gap by laying down our own lives, by picking up our crosses and following Jesus, living our lives for the purposes he directs and prescribes. And then we talked in the next week about clearing the character gap. And we read really specifically this one passage of scripture that Peter wrote. And Peter exhorted us. He said, you need to be diligent. You need to be really diligent about some things. You need to choose moral excellence. You need to choose self-control. And you need to choose perseverance. And you need to choose brotherly kindness. And you need to choose love. You need to be very intentional and diligent about doing these things. You have to actually want to be holy people. And we said that we've all been justified because Jesus did what he did in clearing the holiness gap. We've been justified by God. It's just as if we'd never sinned. We've been justified. But we said it's also about a process of sanctification, that we're supposed to become holy. We've already been given credit for being holy, even though we're not because of our association with Jesus. But we're not supposed to just sit back and rest on that. We're supposed to actually do our best to become that holy person we've been given credit for. And we said sanctification is really about becoming experientially what we already are positionally in Christ. That was the character gap. We said God gave us free will and he hopes that we will use that free will to choose him and choose his ways. And then last week we talked about clearing the discipleship gap. And we said during Jesus' time, there were a lot of different groups that had disciples. A lot of teachers gathered disciples around them and taught them all kinds of things. We said some were discipleship of philosophy, uh, like the Greeks. Some were discipleship of principles, like the Jews. Some were discipleship of procedures, like the Pharisees. We said some were discipleship of protests, like John the Baptist. And then we said there was a different kind of discipleship when it came to Jesus and his followers. And we said it was a discipleship of partnership. It was a discipleship of relationship. And we said that Christianity is not about just a set of principles and procedures and rules and regulations. We said Christianity is not a religion about God. Christianity is a relationship with God. And we said that true Christian discipleship is this idea of partnering with Jesus, being in a relationship with Jesus, walking through every minute of every day, hand in hand, arm in arm, side by side with Jesus, doing whatever it is Jesus wants to do. So now we're going to talk about another gap that we all have in our lives. And if you're ready to hear what God's put on my heart to share with you today, would you do me a favor and say, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Awesome. Today we're going to talk about how to clear the action gap. The action gap. Because here's the thing. It's really easy to have great ideas. I mean, it's really easy to come up with an idea. It's really easy to make massive sweeping plans. Writing out to-do lists is a breeze. Filling out every hour on a day timer. Anybody can do that. Dreaming is easy. Would you agree? And so here's one of the things I've encountered as a pastor over the years. And Annette and I always chuckle because often people will come and say, hey, here's a great idea. You should do this or the church should do that. Here's the thing the church could do. And here's the thing the church could do. And why doesn't the church do this? And why doesn't the church do that? And I always answer the same way Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback, taught me is that's a fantastic idea. When do you start? When do you start that ministry? And often I get that deer in the headlights look, oh, I'm not going to be the one to start it. I'm just giving you the idea. 
You know, I'll just tell you, as a pastor, I've got no shortage of ideas. You should see my idea stack at my house. I've got lots of ideas. I just don't have enough people or resources to enact every one of those ideas. Coming up with ideas, that's easy. Dreaming is easy. It's easy to stay in bed and dream about taking action in some way. It's way easier than actually getting up and doing that thing that you've been dreaming about. But if you never actually take any action, and here's the thing, all of that thinking, all of that planning, all of that dreaming is just that, a pipe dream. And true success in life, real success, actually becoming this person that God created and called you to be, that's going to take action on your part. It requires massive and deliberate action. So how do we do that? How do we take action as Christ followers? This is going to be a real practical message today. We're just going to walk through a list of six things I came up with. I'm sure there's more, but here's six things, six action steps, specific action steps we can take to ensure that we can clear this action gap, that we're doing all the things that are necessary to move from this person who we are to becoming this person we're really intended to. To be. So the first one is an obvious one. It's take a first step. That's the first step. Take a first step. You got to take a first step. There's always a first step before all the other steps. And we've alluded to this a few times already in this series. We said that Christianity is often kind of a three steps forward, two steps back kind of growth thing, right? That you do three things right. You get three steps closer to Jesus and doing the things that you're supposed to do. And then you mess up. You kind of sin along the way and you take two steps backwards. And it's easy to go, oh, I blew it. I took two steps backwards. But listen, if you took three steps forward and you only took two steps backward, you're still one step further than you were the day before. You're making progress. You just got to take a first step. None of us are perfect. We're all going to mess up. Just keep walking forward. Plan your work, work your plan. I'm sure you've heard that before. Take a first step. Always intentionally take another step and another step and another step. Doing something is better than doing nothing. And so don't expect life to change. Don't expect life to get better all by itself. And listen, what did Jesus say? He said, follow me, follow me. And Jesus, as we look at him, well, he is constantly on the move. He is constantly moving, doing things, changing lives, saving lives, healing lives. He's constantly on the move. And so if we're going to follow Jesus, well, we got to be on the move too. we got to be people of action. Look at what God says in Isaiah 55, verse 11. He says that his word goes forth from his mouth. It will not return to him void or empty. It will accomplish everything that he desires for it to accomplish. If we look at that from our New Testament eyes, we realize that was a prophecy about Jesus because Jesus is called the word of God. And so in Isaiah, when God says, my word will not return to me void or empty, my word will accomplish everything I desire. He's saying that's Jesus. He's going to do everything the father wants him to do. He's going to change things. He's going to accomplish everything that's desired. And so following him, that requires us to actually step out in faith and do things as well, take risks as well, overcome fears, intentionally taking forward steps, ministering to other people, building his church, moving our own local church towards that preferred future. And it's our approach. It's our approach to action. It's our willingness to take action or it's our unwillingness to take action that will delineate and define all of us. So here's a couple of things I've learned over the years, just some truisms that I've found to be uh, accurate in my life as well. The smallest action will always easily outweigh the largest good intention. Let me say that again. The smallest action will always easily outweigh the largest good intention. Here's another way to think about it. If the greatest idea is not coupled with action, that idea will never get any larger than the brain cell in which it was formed. Let me say that one more time. If the greatest idea is not coupled with action, that idea will never get any larger than the brain cell in which it was formed. And then there's some great quotes by some guys I admire. General Colin Powell is one. He said, a dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. In other words, it takes action. And then Walt Disney, one of the greatest visionary dreamer planners of all time, said, all our dreams can come true if... We have the courage to pursue them. And then I like to say it this way. God gives us the inspiration, but the perspiration has to come from us. So that's the first step. you got to take a step. Second step is it's okay to help yourself. It's okay to help yourself. Here's what I mean by that. 
you've probably flown on an airplane, most of us have flown on an airplane, and right before you take off, they give you that little safety talk, right? And they tell you all the things, where the exits are, how to use your seatbelt. And one of the things they talk about is if the cabin loses pressure, these little yellow masks are going to fall out of the ceiling, right? And they say, what are you supposed to do with that mask if you're traveling with a young person, a child or somebody that's incapacitated, unable to care for themselves? And your heart, your instinct would be, help that person. That person needs my help. I'm going to take care of my little kid first, right? But the wisdom of the airline says, no, don't do that. Because you might get their mask on, but then you will pass out because you don't have oxygen flowing. And that little kid might not be able to help you after you've passed out. So the best thing to do is to help yourself first. Make sure you are taken care of and that you're in a position where you're able to help other people. That's a wisdom of what we're talking about. It's okay to help yourself. Self-care is also a powerful action step in your spiritual growth. It's a big part of how you close this gap between who you are now and who you know you're actually supposed to be. You have to do that physically, right? You have to get enough sleep. You have to drink enough water. You have to eat the right kinds of things, not eat too much of the wrong kind of things. You have to exercise. And then you have to do this spiritually as well. You have to do some self-care spiritually. You've got to regularly study God's Word and regularly spend time in prayer with Him, having conversations with your Creator. You've got to spend time in worship. It builds your soul uh, to worship God. And you have to spend time in Christian fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Christianity is meant to be a relationship with God and a relationship with other people. Jesus said the entire uh, book of commandments, all of the law, all of the prophets, everything can be boiled down to love God and love people, love God and love people. That's what we're here to do. So you've got to do those things, self-care uh, to make sure you are being taken care of. If you do that, you're going to be more successful. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be able to take care of anyone else either. So maybe you've heard this old adage, God helps those who help themselves. Anybody ever hear that before? What verse is that? What scripture is that? Which book does that come from? It's not in the Bible, right? No. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin's one we give credit for that. It was in Poor Richard's Almanac, but it's probably a much older saying even than that. He, he borrowed it from somewhere. But here's the thing. Some people have heard a lot of preachers insist, you know, the Bible teaches the opposite, that God helps those who cannot help themselves. And I would agree with that. The Bible does teach that God helps those who cannot help themselves. God does certainly offer help to the helpless. He does certainly offer hope to the hopeless. There's no doubt about that. But I think it's also true the Bible teaches that he boosts the efforts of those who are already movers and shakers. And so I disagree that this principle of God, that God helps those who help themselves, I disagree that that's not Biblical, because I think often the help and the hope that God provides to people, he chooses to do so through the actions of his disciples. Just like a parent helps their young child with the oxygen mask on the plane after they've helped themselves. I do what I can. I trust God to help me. Now I can actually care for you. I can make a difference in your life. And so this saying, God helps those who help themselves, it doesn't indicate that God offers no help to anyone who can't help themselves. I don't think that's the intent behind the saying. And it's not promoting a selfish or a self-centered agenda of only help yourself, don't help anybody else, or only do what's best for you. I don't think that's the, the spirit behind it either. The Bible's very clear that God expects his followers to take action, to not just sit back and wait for God to do everything for them. But God also expects his followers to take action on behalf of those who are helpless and take action on behalf of those who don't have any hope, the hopeless people of our world. God is not an enabler of laziness. God is not an enabler of inaction. And so, in fact, the principle of God expecting his disciples to take action, to help themselves, absolutely rings, through, rings true throughout Scripture. And the Bible couldn't possibly be more clear. That brings me to our third action step, which is run to win. Run to win. Look at what 1 Corinthians 9 says. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Paul says run to win. Anybody here actually watch any of the Ironman uh, competition, the, the world champion in Kona a couple of weeks ago? A couple of us did. Anybody here actually compete in the Ironman? Yeah. So Annette and I, we were watching a lot of it, streaming it on our computer, and it was really exciting stuff. That was the first time we'd ever really watched a lot of that race. 
If you don't know what the Ironman is, uh, by the way, it's three races right on top of each other. There's like a two and a half, 2.4 mile swim. Coming out of the water, you immediately go into a 112 mile bike race, and then you jump off your bike and throw your bike to somebody who catches it, and you take off running on a 26.2 mile marathon. Back to back, takes the winners do it in about eight hours, eight and a half hours, uh, the professionals. And then for some people, it takes 12, 13, 14 hours, I think, to actually complete it. But it's an amazing race to watch. And so it really drove home to me this idea that there's this necessity for us to take action. And if we really want to become the person we're supposed to be, we have to be really intentional about it. We have to run to win. So I want you to see a picture of Patrick Langa and Daniela Riff. These are the two who won the race for the male and the female uh, categories. Patrick's from Germany, Daniela's from Switzerland. And they both said they always dreamed of winning the Kona Ironman Triathlon World Championship. It was something they dreamed about their entire lives. They said they spent hours every day dreaming about it, uh, thinking about it, writing down all kinds of training plans, all kinds of nutrition plans, racing strategies. They studied the course for months and months and months. And yet, here's what I want you to think about. What if they'd never actually gotten up off of the couch? <laughs> what if they had never actually trained for the race at all? They just dreamed about it their whole life. Oh, it'd be so awesome to win the Kona Ironman triathlon, right? What if they never did anything? What if they never took a first step? What if they never learned how to swim? What if they never learned how to ride a bike? How successful would they have been? What would their chances be of realizing their dream? And what if they did all of the training for years and years and years, but then didn't get on a plane to come to Kona the week before the race day? What if they decided to stay in Germany or stay in Switzerland? Could they have won the race? No way, right? Of course not. It required action on their part if they were going to succeed. They had to take a first step, then they had to help themselves, they had to take care of themselves, do what was necessary to train themselves, and then they had to run to win. They had to run to win. And Annette and I, we really loved watching them each run their own race. It was a little bit different for each of them. Daniela, she came from behind toward the end of the bike race, and then she finished the marathon with almost a nine-minute lead over her nearest competitor. She, she was close right to the end of the bike race, and then she was just like, boom, gone. Nobody could catch her. It was amazing to watch her run. And then Patrick's race, it was a little closer. He took third place last year in the championship, ended up winning it this year. But all through this race, in the swim part, in the bike part, uh, in the running part, he was always among the three or four top leaders all the way. But when he finished the bike race portion, he was nine minutes behind the current leader, a guy named Lionel Sanders. And all through the 26.2 mile marathon race, Patrick just kept chugging along and he's slowly gaining on Sanders the whole time, slowly gaining on him, slowly gaining on him. Finally, they get to Costco, right down here on the Queen K, and they're just a little bit past Costco towards downtown, and that's when Patrick passed Lionel, and then he just kept rolling. By the time he finished, just three miles later in the race, he was like 12 minutes ahead of Lionel, the guy that had been leading that whole time. And his nearest competitor was a guy named David McNamee. He was five and a half minutes behind Patrick. It was just really an amazing thing. And so when Patrick finished this race, he had set a new world record for the course. It was just really incredible. And you could just see the, the joy on his face. And Nett and I were sitting there, tears rolling down our face, just so happy for this guy with the accomplishment. He just kept saying, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. And it was so exciting and so inspiring for us that Annette and I, we decided we're going to run the marathon to Ironman next year. <laughs> Stop laughing, that's rude. So, now here's the thing. All through the day as you watch, right, these two cross it in record time. But for hours afterwards, there's still amateur people coming across the line hours later. People in their 70s, people in their 80s. One guy, the oldest guy was 85, I think, who was running it. And I don't think he finished, but he did like... 68 or 70 of the 112 miles of the bike race and then he dropped out at that point and I thought man he did better than I did because I'd have drowned on the swimming part I would have never made it back in and so all these people that are coming in and you're thinking that's still an amazing accomplishment just qualifying because you got it's a really stiff competition just to qualify to be allowed to try to run this race that's an amazing accomplishment coming in second coming even in last place people coming in at midnight you know, hours and hours after the original winners did. Still amazing. And the people who organized the Ironman, they realized that. So as everybody's coming across that finish line, whether they were first or 2,000th 
in the, in the pool of people running, as they come across the line, they'd call out their name. And, you know, if it was me, this would be fun. But they'd say, Greg Scott, you are an Iron Man. Annette Scott, you are an Iron Man. And just every single person that came across that line. Wow. It was really a great, encouraging, inspiring thing. And so here's the deal. When it comes to our spiritual race in life, this is what Paul's saying. Don't just phone it in. Don't just phone it in. Even though you know you're saved, oh, Jesus saved me, now I can just sit back and skate through life because Jesus is going to take care of everything. I don't have to do anything else. I'm saved. Even if you know you can't beat the Patrick Langas of the world, do your absolute very best, Paul says. Run your race as if you're trying to win it all. And Paul asks this question. Why would anyone run a race without running it as if they wanted to win? Why enter a race if you don't really want to win? Just go out and run. Don't enter a race. If you're entering a race, wouldn't you want to try and win? At least maybe winning for you is just beating your own personal best from the year before. Not necessarily beating all the genetically gifted professionals out there. But why race at all if you don't love winning? That's the point Paul's making in our spiritual progress and our spiritual success plans as well. If we really want to be the person God called and created us to be. If we really want, like the army slogan says, be all that you can be, right? If we really want to do that, we have to actually take action in life. We have to run our spiritual race, giving it our very best, trying our hardest to win the race. So we see at the end of Paul's life that he took his own advice, right? Second Timothy 4, he says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. He didn't say, you know, I came in first. He just said, I finished the course. I kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You've got to run to win. Fourth step is, always remember you're never running alone. Remember, you're never running alone. Here's what the author of Hebrews, who was likely a disciple of Paul's, nobody knows for sure who wrote Hebrews, but definitely somebody closely connected to Paul. And he writes these words, Therefore, since we have... So great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Remember, you're never running alone. You're following the path of many other Christians who have already come before you down through the centuries. And if they can do it, you can do it. And then even more important, you're following Jesus. He's the leader of this race of life. He's the Patrick Langa of this race of life. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who sets the pace. And so you trust him. You follow him. You follow the path that he's carved out for you. You aren't in this alone, and you're not doing it on your own power alone. St. Augustine said it this way, God provides the wind, but man must raise the sails. It's kind of like you know the same thing I said with the idea of it. God provides the inspiration, but you provide the perspiration. You've got to do some work. You've got to take action. You've got to run the race. But he's reminding us God's going to help you. God's going to give you extra grace and power and mercy and encouragement. He's going to give it to everyone who follows him. But he expects us to raise our sails and run the best race we possibly can, spiritually speaking. God is committed to filling in the gaps for all of us who aren't perfect. Anybody besides me here that's not perfect? Anybody not perfect? All of us, right? But it's not entirely up to us. God's going to help us no matter what. But listen, God is never going to encourage sloth. God is never going to encourage somebody who doesn't actually follow. God wants people who are going to try their best to reach their fullest potential as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So here's the question you have to ask. Who is God calling me to be? What is God calling me to do? How am I supposed to make the world a better place? That's who this person over here on the other side of the gap is that we've been talking about. We said at the very beginning, even before God created the universe, he'd already imagined you. He'd already planned you. You have a specific purpose, a specific reason that you are on earth. And if you're still alive today, that means you haven't completed your purpose yet. You've still got something else 
you're supposed to do. You've been called and created by God with a specific purpose. And if you don't know what that is yet, you really got to figure that out. That's a top priority. Figure out why am I here? What am I supposed to do? What is my purpose? And you have to decide, are you a spectator or are you a racer? Are you ready to get in the race? Because God doesn't want mere spectators, okay? When you finish this life, when you finish the course, then you get to be part of the cloud of witnesses. You get to be part of the spectators cheering the rest of the Iron Man and Iron Women people coming along in the race. You've crossed the finish line, and there's still more people coming behind you. That was one of the greatest things to watch of this Iron Man race, is even hours, hours, hours after the winners won, there's still massive amounts of people lined up the finish line cheering on those people just as hard as they cheered on the winner. And I thought, man, that's the cloud of witnesses the author of Hebrews is talking about. And when you get to heaven, they're going to be like, Woo, you made it. You're an Iron Man. You're an Iron Man. You're an Iron Man. It's just going to be fantastic, right? And so look at what the Apostle Peter says. He says in 1 Peter 1, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this word in the New American Standard Translation that says, prepare your minds for action, that comes from a Greek word, anazonume. Anazonume means, it can also be translated as I gird up or as I brace up. It's just this view that I'm getting ready to do active exertion of some kind. It really comes as a metaphor uh, for girding up your tunic. The people in, in the ancient Greeks, they wore these long dress-like you know, robes and tunics. And so when they went out to do some hard work in the garden or they were going to run a race, they would lift that tunic up and tuck it into their belt so that they weren't tripping over their clothes all the time. That's what this word, anazonume, means. It's to gird up your loins, right? And so when they would do this, they would not trip over what they were wearing. And so Peter's giving the same advice that we should have that same kind of mental preparation, that same kind of spiritual preparation. And he says, what trips you up spiritually? What trips you up mentally? And he says, well, you know, think about it. It's going to be the sins that entangle us, and it's all these things that, that get in our way. And so you've got to get those things out of the way and not trip over them. Remove all the trip hazards from your mind. Then we get to step number five. Don't dwell on the past. Focus on the future. Don't dwell on the past focus on the future. We've all got pasts. We've all got regrets. We've all got mistakes. We've all got poor choices. We've all got examples of bad behavior that we engaged in, missed opportunities. We've all experienced tragedies. We've all experienced being poorly treated in our past by someone. And sometimes these bad things in our past that happened even just yesterday, or maybe it happened five minutes before you got here today. And you can't run a race with your focus on the prize ahead of you if you're constantly turning to look back and see what's behind you. You're going to fall. You're going to trip and fall. And I talk to people sometimes who've been so hurt by someone else, or they feel so guilty for the way they themselves acted towards someone in the past that they start to feel like they're just not even worthy to be in God's spiritual race anymore. Someone else has made them feel unworthy or they've beat up on themselves enough that they don't feel worthy anymore. So they just stop taking any action in their spiritual life. And they're really stuck in the past. They're stuck and they're missing out on their present and they're missing out on their future that God intends for them. And Paul, he talked a lot about this value of not dwelling in the past. Look at what he says in Philippians 3. Not that I have already obtained it. He says, this is before I crossed the finish line. I haven't already obtained it. I haven't already become perfect. But here's what I do. I press on. I want you to hold on to that phrase. I press on. Why? So that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Again, he says, listen, I'm not saying I've crossed the finish line. I'm not saying I'm done. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting what lies behind me. Forget the past. Reaching forward to what lies ahead. Focus on the future. Uh, here it is again. Press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So remember that. Press on. Because it leads us to our sixth step, which is never give up. Never give up. Twice in this passage, Paul says, I'm going to press on. And the Greek word he chooses to use here is dioko. And dioko means to aggressively chase something. 
And it's really used as a, a metaphor for a hunter pursuing their catch or pursuing their prize. It means to pursue something with all haste, to chase after it, to earnestly desire to overtake what is ahead. It reminds me of Patrick Langa, who comes from the end of that bike race, and he's just constantly pursuing, constantly pursuing Lionel Sanders until he overtakes him. That was what he was doing. He was pressing on to win the prize. And I remember learning this lesson myself you know, back in Little League Baseball days. And here was the deal. Our team was Park National Bank, and we were a championship team in, in Little League days. And there was this one game, we were in the fourth inning, into the fourth inning, and we were losing by 12 runs. And in Little League, you only play six innings. And so I was the starting third baseman at the time, and I had just become really discouraged in this game. We'd all been playing terribly, making a lot of errors, and we were behind by 12 runs with two innings to play. And I said out loud, well, that's it. We're not going to win this. We're definitely going to lose. And my coach heard me, which was not a good thing. And he got down in my face and real sternly said, I don't want to hear that out of you. I don't want to hear that out of any of my players. If that's your attitude, then I might as well just sit you on the bench right now and we'll play the rest of the game without you. I don't want quitters on my team. I was like, I'm sorry, coach. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm not, I, I believe we'll, we'll win. I'm, I'm not quitting. Please put me back in. And he gave me a second chance. He let me play again. He put me back out on the field. Well, here's the cool thing about this. We came from behind and we won that game. In the last two innings, we scored 13 runs and we won the game. And I hit a grand slam home run for four of those runs along the way. Why did that happen? Because we didn't quit. We didn't give up. I was starting to quit. I was starting to give up. My coach said, hey, don't you quit. Don't you give up on me. And that's the same thing God does for us, right? We get discouraged sometimes and we just want to lay down and die and say, oh, it's not worth it. I give up. I quit. And Jesus is always right there saying, hey, don't talk like that. I don't want you to be a quitter. We're going to win. We're just going to be a victory together if you don't give up. Keep going. Keep doing your very best. We didn't dwell on the past. Instead, we pressed on. We pursued victory. We didn't give up. We actually won. James, Jesus' half-brother, he shares some powerful advice from us. That's what we're going to wrap it up with this morning. This powerful advice from James. It's about not giving up on our desire to clear our action gaps. Here's what James says. Blessed is the man or the woman. Blessed is the man or the woman who res remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial. Because when you've stood the test, you will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Don't give up. Never, 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 never give up. So let me just sum all this up. Let's hit all six of these again real quickly. What was the first step? Number one, take a first step. All right? Do something. It's better to do something than nothing. Second, take care of yourself. It's okay to help yourself. You've got to do some self-care along the way because you want to last as long as possible and you want to be able to help as many others as possible. And if you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of anybody else. Number three, run to win. Don't just phone in your Christian life. Don't just skate through it. Don't just coast. Get off your butt and do your best, right? Run to win. Number four, remember, you're never running alone. There have been all these other Christians who have done it before you. And if they can do it, you can do it. And Jesus ran it before you. He was the first one. And he's the author and the perfecter of it. And he's not going to ask you to follow him if he doesn't think you're capable of finishing the race. You're never running alone. Jesus is always right there with you. The wind in your sails as long as you put those sails up and let him push you. And then number five, don't dwell on the past. That's where the devil loves to keep us is in our past. Because if he can keep us in our past, he can control us, right? Jesus is in our future. Jesus is in our present. He doesn't want us focused on the past. The past is gone. There's nothing you can do about the past. There's nothing you can change about the past. So it's a complete waste of time and energy to focus on it. Instead, focus on where I am right now, this guy over here, and focus on who I'm supposed to be, the future, where I'm supposed to get to, and I've got to clear that action gap. Don't look at the past look at the future. And then number six, never give up. It's going to be hard sometimes. Life's hard. There's all kinds of tough things that come our way, things that trip us up, things that slow us down, things that try to detour us. There's always something fighting against you. Life's not easy. But don't give up. If you don't give up, if you remain steadfast under trial, James says, if you'll stand the test, you will finish the race. You'll win the crown of life. You'll cross the finish line and there's going to be a cloud of witnesses saying, you're an Iron Man. You're an Iron Man. You're an Iron Man.
Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this message about taking action. We want to be people of action. We want to be people who change the world for the better, change our community for the better. We want to see our church grow and impact our world. We want to be uh, people who make you proud, Father, people who really live the life you designed us to live. Help us now, even if we're sitting here and we're saying, I don't know who that person is. I don't know who I'm called and created to be. I don't know what my purpose is. Do I really have a purpose? Yes, you have a purpose. I guarantee it. I promise you. The Bible promises you. You have a purpose. You are alive today. You're still breathing today because you still have a purpose. You have a reason to be here. So find that purpose if you don't know what it is. God, help each one of us be people of action. Take this action step to clear this action gap to becoming the people we're called to be, to changing the world in the way we're supposed to change it. Help us bring you glory. Help us bring people to you. Help us bring people along with us and introduce them to you so that they can experience this same life change that we're talking about for us. That's my prayer for all of us today. In Jesus' name, amen.